Nonviolence, Chapter 2, From Pacifist Abolitionism to Gandhi and Tolstoy, Section, India from the Sepoys' Mutiny to Gandhi's Nonviolence. Although falling irredeemably into crisis with the Civil War, the U.S. pacifist movement continued to exercise influence in the 20th century. In professing the ideal of nonviolence, in 1907, Gandhi paid tribute to Thoreau, celebrated as a champion of civil disobedience, and defined as, quote, one of the greatest and most moral men America has produced, end quote. The translation of the nonviolence movement from the United States to India is readily intelligible. Within the British Empire, the black slaves freed in 1833 were replaced by Indian and Chinese coolies, who in the final analysis were slaves. Above all, following the Sepoys Mutiny, in the eyes of the British colonizers, the Indians became, to all intents and purposes, niggers, members of an inferior race capable of any barbarism. Unlike Afro-Americans, the Indian people of color could not place their hopes in the abolitionists and army of the North. At the zenith of its power and glory, the British Empire enjoyed solid popular support at home. Meanwhile, possible revolutionary ambitions were frozen by memories of the terrible repression that had followed the revolt of 1857. In their correspondence, British officers had gloried in the power of life and death wielded by them, in sovereign and sometimes amused fashion over Indians. Marx drew attention to some of these letters. Quote, we hold court-martials on horseback, and every nigger we meet we either string up or shoot. Not a day passes, but we string up ten to fifteen of them. End quote. Peaceful inhabitants were often affected. As a British officer acknowledged in a letter published in the Times, quote, the European troops have become fiends when opposed to natives. End quote. The picture sketched here is confirmed in contemporary historiography. In the British community, jubilation at, quote, destroying the enemies of our race was general. The wife of an officer noted in her diary, quote, I can only look forward with awe to the day of vengeance when our hands shall be dipped in the blood of our enemies and the tongues of our dogs shall be red with the same, end quote. Physical elimination of the barbarians was not regarded as sufficient. Before being executed, captured sepoys were forced to kneel and lick the blood they had shed in the massacre they had perpetrated, which still bathed the soil. This was an especially repugnant gesture for upper caste Hindus, and some of them resigned themselves to such humiliation only after having been mercilessly flogged. Overall, the Sepoys' Rebellion had left behind it a huge trail of blood and hatred, and, far from leading to an improvement in the conditions of Indians, had worsened them further. Such a tragedy was not to recur, all the more so in that the international scene confirmed the invincibility of the British Empire, and the West as a whole. With the Battle of Omdurman in 1898, Britain succeeded in once again subjugating Sudan which had defeated the British and secured independence. Now the white supermen felt the need to redeem the humiliation they had suffered. They did not confine themselves to finishing off enemies horribly wounded by dum-dum bullets. They destroyed the tomb of the Mahdi, the inspirer and author of the anti-colonial resistance. His body was decapitated and, while the rest of his body was thrown into the Nile, his head was carried off as a trophy. Two years later, with the Boxer Rebellion, China sought to shake off the colonial yoke that increasingly oppressed it. In this instance, too, combined repression by the civilized great powers, among them Great Britain, proved ruthless and irresistible. This was the occasion on which the German Emperor Wilhelm II called on his troops to conduct themselves in such a way that no Chinese would ever dare to look a German in the face. In similar fashion, in the late 19th century, the British community in India exhorted the Indian people never to lose sight of the fact that, quote, a European, 
a white man, wherever he went, represented the governing race. End quote. In fact, the lesson implicit in the repression of the Sepoys' mutiny was still fresh. In his autobiography, Gandhi recalled a memory from his childhood and adolescence. Quote, a doggerel was in vogue amongst us schoolboys, which, with reverential fear, inquired into the reasons for the incontestable supremacy of the British Empire. Behold the mighty Englishman. He rules the Indian small. End quote. We can now understand the reference to the civil disobedience of Thoreau, whose subsequent celebration of Brown, the abolitionist who dreamed of encouraging and leading the Southern Slaves' armed rebellion, was ignored or passed over in silence. At the same time, Gandhi stressed the endogenous roots of his political thinking. In a letter of September 1935, the man who had now become the undisputed leader of the Indian independence movement stated that, quote, nonviolence was always an integral part of our struggle, end quote. The autobiography published 10 years earlier clarifies the terms of the issue, already accepted in the family circle. Quote, My faith in vegetarianism grew on me from day to day, end quote, and acquired philosophical force during his stay in London as a law student from 1888 to 1891. In the English capital, Gandhi came into contact with vegetarian and theosophical circles, that were disgusted by the violent dominion exercised by the West over the animal and human worlds, and committed to seeking an alternative in the East, in antique Indian wisdom, and above all in Jainism, which was pervaded by faith in ahimsa, nonviolence to be practiced toward every sentient being. Following his studies in London and a brief return to India came Gandhi's long stay in South Africa. Here, during the struggle against the discrimination and humiliation imposed on the Indian community, in 1906, Gandhi founded the Passive Resistance Association, which was later named the Satyagraha Association, employing a Hindi substantive intended to be more pugnacious and signifying a power derived not from violence, and not merely from passive renunciation of the latter, but primarily from stubborn attachment to the truth and unconditional respect for life. Now the theoretical platform and political project of the new movement were sufficiently clear, as was underlined by a letter of December the 3rd, 1907. It was necessary, quote, at all costs to resist the colonial powers oppression and humiliation, but in the most peaceful manner. End quote, and end of section.